Okay, so you're going to have to save it at, at the end also. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to cover now how to document software through metadata. So you've published your software in a repository, and now how do you document it? Uh, so we talked about publishing your software on your website or maybe in a repository. Is, is this sufficient for others to reuse it now that it's out there and it's public, right? So we want you to think about the difference between putting your software in a repository where it will reside and um, putting some metadata about your software in a registry. So. Um, so GitHub, for example, is a, is a good case of a repository where you put the software there, it supports uh, versions, it supports a group of developers. Um, it doesn't ask you for very much in terms of describing your code. So everybody will put a readme file, the license you can put somewhere, the contributors, and that's about it. There's other repositories. Um, uh, MATLAB Central is a good example where they'll have um, places where you can actually put some more detailed descriptions of your software, your, your MATLAB code. Uh, CSDMS is uh, one of the repositories in geosciences for models and um, they actually have a quite extensive set of metadata that you can attach to the software. So software metadata is really useful information about the code that helps others um, search and find it uh, just like you use metadata for data. Okay. And in Autosoft, we're um, developing a software registry for geosciences that is devoted to capturing metadata. So you can put your code on GitHub or wherever you choose and then use Autosoft to describe the metadata. So we want to cover now uh, what kind of metadata you should uh, document about your software so that it supports reuse, uh, it helps others reuse it. And then we'll tell you how to use a software registry to specify that metadata. So just like we've been doing with the other parts of the training, first we uh, tell you about best practices and concepts, and then we'll tell you in practice what, what to go out and do. So to, to, if you think about software metadata, it should be focused on um, helping other people understand uh, find the software and compare it to other similar software. So uh, we'll talk about six major categories of software metadata. Uh, we've developed these categories as part of the Ontosoft project. Um, we have been looking at and discussing a lot of different kinds of metadata with um, uh, Mozilla, ESIP working groups, um, uh, the NSF, uh, software Sustainability Institute workshops. So there's a lot of uh, people interested on in how you describe software and we're going to walk you through uh, six different categories of ways to describe software very much centered on science software. So we're not describing here some uh, piece of infrastructure. Uh, we're really discussing how a scientist would look at software. That's what these categories are focused on. So the first category is to identify the software. So of course you want to know its name, a brief description, the unique identifier. So how can I know this is the software that that paper cited? Uh, and then maybe some general categories and keywords. Um, uh, you may also specify the, the project website or the code repository where the software actually lives. So these things kind of help you make sure that uh, if you're using a piece of software called Gold, that it's actually the piece that you were looking for and that you meant to, to use. Uh, the second category of metadata has to do with understanding the software. So you're a scientist, what do you need to know about it to see what the software does? So one of the things you may um, uh, specify is uses and assumptions. So you want to use the software for X, Y, and Z, and this software assumes the following things about the data, and then you may specify constraints on how to use it, um, and maybe some other limitations. So, um, uh, so those things help someone understand what the software is for. Uh, you may specify domain-specific keywords, be much more specific about if you're doing water runoff, what kind, or, or much more specific than that. 
And then, uh, last but not least, that's why it's at the top, you may want to link your software with similar software. You may want to say it's similar to what this other software does, but my software is in R instead of being in MATLAB or something like that. Uh, another uh, thing that helps understand the software is uh, the kind of general metadata that we saw before from the Dublin core, the kind of general metadata that uh, we associate with uh, data and software. So the creator, the major contributors, um, the funding sources, um, the you know uh, in projects or institutes or centers that have adopted the software, uh, publications that have used the software. Uh, it also helps you understand the software if you see general use statistics, you see how popular it is, the ratings by users. Um, it helps you if you see benchmark information and how the software has done with a certain set of uh, challenge problems of data. So. Uh, the other thing that helps you is to see and understand the commitment for support of the software. So uh, that gives you a sense for how much you can really rely on it. Uh, the next category is about running the software. So now you know you have identified the right piece of software, you have understood what it does, now how do you actually uh, run it? So first, the access to the software. So uh, see if it has a license. What do you need to do to use that software? What permissions do you have to use it? The, the location of the code. This may be different from the location of the project, for example. Uh, and then uh, it could be the location of the executable if the source code is not shared. Uh, once you get a hold of the code and you know that you're licensed to reuse it, uh, you need to install it. So to help other people install your software, you may want to document uh, general uh, features of it. You may want to uh, specify installation instructions, the implementation language. Um, we talked before about specifying dependencies on other software. You can do this in metadata. Uh, you can specify memory requirements, any other runtime requirements. You may want to say how long it takes to run it. Um, Especially if you provide test data, you know, if the software is running for an hour and you don't get an answer, that's not a good sign. You may want to say what to expect in terms of runtime. And there can be a lot of other things to say about software installation. So there may be parallel code, maybe you run the software uh, using clusters and you want to specify further things. So there may be a lot more things that you say about installation, but those are at the top the general things that you may want to say. And then um, how uh, you can uh, run it. So you've installed it, you know all the dependencies, you have everything ready, and so to run it you really want test instructions and some test data. So these are all to do with executing the software. The fourth category is if you run into any problems or if you would like an extension or if you find a bug yourself and you'd like to you know, submit a bug fix or something like that, um, you know, how to contact the developers and also what's the level of support provided? Can you support, can you, can you expect any kind of support? The, the fifth category of metadata for software is um, metadata that helps you actually do research. So one aspect of doing research is experimenting with the software. So you're running data, you're trying different parameter values and so on. And in order to be able to do that, uh, you need to know what the input data is, what the parameters are, what is the output generated, and also uh, give your potential users a list of uh, relevant data catalogs or data sources that they can consult to try out uh, their problems with uh, data. So for example, if you are publishing a hydrology model and one of the inputs is the elevation of the terrain, you may want to point to some national elevation maps that, uh, where, that you normally access to, to get your data for elevation. And so that way people can run their own um, uh, catchments with uh, the national elevation data sources. 
then uh, you may also do research with the software, but you want to now visualize the results, or maybe your data is in a different kind of format. So it's nice if you mention that together with your software, there's other pieces of software that you use in combination. So you may say, I, you know, here's the model, but actually when I prepare the elevation data, I'll use this script that I published elsewhere, or I'll do this data visualization with the results, and you publish those other pieces of software, and so that gives someone else the idea that they can actually compose the software that you're publishing with other pieces of software to really do more of the end-to-end -end, um, data analysis. Uh, eventually, you may want to want to compose the software together into a workflow. We'll talk more about this uh, a bit later. And then when you're doing research, it's very natural to want to cite so that you can get credit and you can get recognition for the software. So you should uh, include a software citation. We talked earlier about what um, uh, the format should take, um, but you can either uh, request that your software is cited as a whole project uh, or as a particular publication that you have had or maybe as, as a DOI if you have your software in GitHub or some other repository. Um, so you should specify how you would like to get the credit. Um, and finally, metadata that helps others track new versions. So you should always say um, this particular DOI and this particular uh, descriptions correspond to this software version. It was released in this date. It supersedes this prior version, and it will be superseded by the following version, which is expected at some latter date. Okay. Uh, also, tracking updates. Uh, you should specify if the software is under development, if you're planning major extensions and releases, and if there is a community where the user can maybe ask questions or work with to, to help improve the software. A lot of people are very much of the mindset of trying to help develop the software that they end up using. So, okay. So those are the six major categories. Any of those uh, categories, any of those um, metadata uh, aspects that we mentioned could be useful for someone to find the software that they need. So a scientist out there might say, I want our code for water runoff, or I want to see all the software that you know John uh, blah blah has published, or software that is well supported and is in Perl or you know, based on the function, uh, software that simulates water runoff, or based on the type of data that is processed. So I want software that uses elevation data. So all of the uh, metadata that we've been talking about can be useful for a user to investigate and compare different pieces of software and then decide. Everybody has a preference for different things. OK, uh, so, so here's a, a few. Um, uh, scenarios where you that may give rise to questions. So, for example, what if you release many versions of the software? Uh, so, um, maybe you release a new version once a month. Maybe you release a new version every few months. So, any any significant versions, uh, you should give unique unique identifiers. Especially if you think they're going to be cited in a paper, you should be very clear about the version that was used, and always make it easy for others to find. Um, subsequent and previous versions. So that's always helpful to have handy and be able to relate the different versions to one another. Uh, what if your software is already in a public repository? Well, then you should consider creating a good documentation and description of the software in addition to just making it public and saying, you know, uh, there's a paper that generally uses this software and it's how in doing that research, that's how I wrote the software. Uh, so try to document the software uh, properly yourself. Uh, what if the software is very small? So maybe it's just a little conversion routine that you did. So you know, if you think it may be useful to anyone else, someone out there, imagine on the web, maybe there's 10 people that want to read your blog or something like that. Um, but those 10 people really care about the kinds of things that you say. So you never know who is out there and where they are that might want something that you have to share. So we always say, even if it's small, even if it's not a big deal to you, maybe to other cities, especially if they don't program, it may help them a lot. 
I, I hear this a lot actually that people finding little snippets of software that actually contain useful ways to do particular data manipulations or do something efficiently so people really like to poke around and see how others do their code so it's always helpful to publish things out there. Uh, what if you have a very large software package that has many functions? So maybe you have a, a huge model for hydrology. It will do all kinds of different simulations and uh, functions, and it can combine models, and it can take into account hydro, uh, um, vegetation and other things. So you may consider releasing the, the, the big, the, the whole package, the large package, for anyone who wants all of this flexibility and functionality. You may also want to consider releasing pieces of that software. So to say, uh, if somebody wants um, uh, to, to use a particular functionality, so they just want to, to simulate water runoff, and they don't need to install all of the GIS stuff that you have as part of your package. They don't need to install all the other uh, subtle uh, improvements that you've done to integrate models. They just want your water runoff aspects. So if you think that might be interesting to others, you may want to uh, publish just that piece and characterize it so others can find it. And then finally, if your software is set up to run in a local cluster or cloud, and that's the way that others would ideally use it, then uh, make sure that you document with good instructions how others can install it elsewhere. So, so those are all best principles in general. How should you go about uh, really describing the software and, and using a software registry? So this is uh, a, a snapshot of the same thing that I showed you earlier. This is a GitHub page for a particular piece of software of uh, one of our GPF authors. So uh, it shows that there's actually quite a bit of uh, aspects here that have to do with the metadata we mentioned. So we mentioned you should talk about uh, the particular software version and release and the date of it. So there's information in GitHub, for example, that will uh, capture that. Uh, the contributors, so here you have a place where the contributors are listed. The license, the instructions for installation, maybe some of the assumptions are in the readme file. Um, the pull requests, so those are all ways to uh, maintain the, the software. So, uh, you know, these, these catalogs have all of these different aspects of the software and metadata. But it's not comprehensive. It doesn't have, for example, nowhere in here does it say in what language the software is written in. Uh, or it doesn't say very clearly that it's a climate model in this case, for example. So, uh, if you use a software registry, uh, I mentioned before that we're building onto soft. You may want to use um, CSDMS. There's a lot of software registries out there. And if you use a software registry, it will guide you through the metadata, just like a, a data uh, registry will guide you through. So, uh, so I'm going to um, uh, tell you a little bit about how this works. If you go to ontosoft.org uh, portal, you'll find the ontosoft portal. And um, you can play with it, and you can actually browse through a lot of uh, software that's already described there, and also, uh, you know, uh, start the description of your own software. So what it will do is it, it will ask you questions along those six major categories that I told you about, and actually ask you questions. Some of them, some of the questions will be important, and some of the questions will be optional. And each one of these questions has to do with some aspect of um, the metadata that we mentioned earlier. And a very interesting thing is that the minute that uh, you see all these questions in the screen, at the bottom you can see a question that says, is there a project website for the software? So if you uh, put in a URL to a GitHub site, then it will crawl through all the metadata that I'm highlighting here in red from the GitHub site, and will start to populate the answers to some of these questions. Okay, and when you answer all of the important uh, questions, uh, then you'll see the piece of the pie that corresponds to that category of metadata show in a more bluish tone. So it means that it's more complete. And if it has some pieces in red, it means you didn't answer some important questions. And that's okay. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's just a small routine or a small script, and you don't want to spend a lot of time uh, 
specifying all of these things. So that's that's quite all right. Um, so this is how you would uh, characterize your software uh, along all of these dimensions. The other thing is that if you go to Ontosoft, you can uh, find software on various topics, uh, so keywords, for example, hydrological models or the language that they're written in. So you may find similar software to yours, and so that will help you uh, compare uh, to other software as well. And so when you introduce your software in your paper, you can say it's similar to this other software if you're more familiar with it, except that mine does things in this other different way. So at the moment, we have uh, more than 600 entries. Um, many of them have come from CSDMS, the CSDMS repository. Uh, others have come from the C4P uh, Research Coordination Network that is part of EarthCube. So this is Paleo Geoscience. Um, and they actually got together and decided to compile themselves all the major pieces of software that they use. Um, many of them uh, are available from various NOAA websites, and so that way their community has this cluster of software uh, in a repository that they can search and, and look through. Uh, so you can browse through all this software in the Ontosoft uh, portal, and you can also, um, uh, I guess you can see in the middle of the screen uh, a little button that says compare. So if I have found all of these hydrology models implemented in C++ with a GPL license, I can uh, click on compare, select that, and then it will show me something like this. So it will show me side by side all these different pieces of software and uh, the features that I care about and get a comparison table that let me see side by side what the different software does. So if I care a lot about um, understanding the software, maybe the one on the very right is not a good one to use because it you can see that there's more red, so it might not be very well described. Um, but I recognize what it's doing. I don't need a whole lot of explanation about you know, sediment fluxes, so uh, I'm happy to use it. And I care a lot about uh, getting support for it. And so that part of this, uh, of the uh, pie chart is very blue, so that means that uh, I know exactly how to get support for this thing. So, uh, so that's a way to, to help you compare the software. You can imagine including something like this in one of your papers to say, you know, I'm, I developed this software, I'm using it, and I'm publishing results with it, and here's what it does, and here's how it compares to others. Okay. The other thing that we let you do is take your software and, uh, sorry, take all this metadata about your software, and you can ask for uh, uh, the metadata. So what we'll do is we'll give you an HTML file that has all of the metadata, all of the questions that you answered. So you can put it on your GitHub page, on your project page, on your personal page, and it will have all of this documentation, all of this different metadata about your software. Um, you can ask for an XML, or if you're uh, if you want to use RDF, for example, the semantic web language versus just XML, uh, we can give you that as well. So that means that uh, the, the description of your software is structured so that machines can actually access it on the web um, as well. Or you can get JSON, and so you may want to use it to um, you know, do some uh, manipulations on the metadata programmatically if you choose to do so. But um, in general, at least get the XML, HTML and publish it on your uh, software website. And so others will have a good uh, roster of all the ways that you've answered the questions. So you can use a tool like Ontosoft. You can use any other. Um, uh, software registry to document it. I mentioned CSDMS, that's another really good one to use. And uh, really the simplest possible thing that you can use is to you know, put your software somewhere and describe as much metadata as you can. So uh, the slides here have gone through a lot of different kinds of metadata. So you can just document it informally. You can just make sure that you pick a license, make sure that you uh, document uh, version. So, so just do your best as, as, at describing software metadata. This is the simplest approach because 
even though this is a very active area of research and of discussion in the community, I know ESIP has a forum for software description and citation uh, that's very active and, and will take some time to come to recommendations and so on. Uh, there's no universal or standard recommendations in terms of software metadata. There's not even a Dublin core for software metadata. So at least do your best at describing and maybe use these slides as a checklist. Um, uh, but of course, if you want to, you can, um, you know, go to uh, the Ontosoft site, uh, maybe CSDMS if you choose, and then just go over all the questions that um, uh, you you can answer about your software, and that way it will be more comprehensive than otherwise. And then take the metadata and publish it in your website. Okay, that's the simple and the ideal approach to, to software metadata. Any questions about this portion? Um, I had a question. Um, I'm trying to write up documentation for, the, for a, a model that I developed, and I'm kind of writing it like in a manual style. Uh huh. And I'm Giving as much detail as possible so that hopefully, you know, you hand this thing to a student and they can run with it. But what I haven't done as much, I guess, is write comments in the scripts themselves that maybe others would understand. And I'm wondering if it's very necessary to go through these 50 scripts that are, you know, thousands of lines long and comment it so that someone else can like really understand each line? That's an excellent question. So, you know, of course, if your code you expect that many others will use and you really care to help them reuse it, uh, you may want to go through all those 50 files and all those details, right? If you feel that kind of responsibility or, or urge to help others in that way. I have a lot of colleagues that will do that. So they'll block out a couple of weeks in the summer and that's all they do for two weeks because they really feel compelled to getting um, their code as, re as much uh, reuse as possible. They want to help others reuse their work. Um, but it is a lot of work. So uh, you know, don't necessarily feel obligated to do that kind of work. You have put a tremendous amount of work just in writing that software, right? The, the point that we're trying to make is that by releasing that software, imagine that you release it in whatever, um, you know, suboptimal, not necessarily very understandable format, at least the next person has that. And so they could maybe, uh, it's a graduate student, and maybe they'll learn a lot from just going through your code as they try to reuse it. And as they play with it and discover how it works, maybe they are the ones that add the comments. And so I think that by opening the software and opening the data, we kind of help each other. So we say, oh, I didn't understand what this data represented, but after I read the paper 10 times and finally I emailed the author, I see that this is why this looks like this, so I'm going to document that in the repository, right? So I think that we all can expect uh, to contribute to what other people have done so that you don't have to develop the software and document the code and modularize it and provide metadata. Maybe those are things that different people can do as we reuse each other's work. Um, and the last thing that I will mention is that uh, maybe the details of the code will only be useful if someone really wants to change the code in some way. Uh, most people will probably want to just use your software as is and just play with it, have a, uh, something to compare their work to. Maybe they're looking for another uh, piece of software that has similar functionality so they can compare what they've done to. And if that's the case, uh, the main thing that they'll want to know about is uh, what kinds of variables you were using, uh, how they're used in the code, and, and the kinds of assumptions that you made so that their results are comparable. Yeah, you, so that's kind of yeah. how um, I've envisioned it, for sure. Yes. It also has, like, a, the scripts actually run in the background so that no one ever actually looks at the code. 
it's uh -huh. more of a user friendly type of interface. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, what, so it what, would really be the comments in the code would only be for someone to actually edit the code itself, but not to run it. But okay. yeah, I yes. guess I'll have to weigh the benefits of. Yes. Of so I've, I've mentioned all these. I've mentioned all these very general things, uh, but specifically, I think what would be most helpful if you go to CSDMS Colorado EDU this website. Uh, search for standard names and read up on standard names. So this is work for, by one of the Ontosoft PIs, uh, Scott Peckham. So he has compiled um, a lot of different variables that different models uh, use or generate um, and a lot of different assumptions. And he has uh, designed a um, format that is very systematic about how to name these different variables so that they're very clear on what they refer to. And so uh, there's papers about these standard names, there's actually a, a lot of documentation about these different variables, and um, we are developing uh, extensions of the portal so that you can actually uh, document these variables. So you can say, um, you know, the input will be elevation, and inside of the code, uh, the variable in the code is called e EL, for example. And so that will give someone a hook to knowing exactly what physical variable uh, is coming in and what is it called in the code, and at least it helps uh, document what the code is doing to the data. Yeah, that uh, means. Yeah, send email to Ontosoft. Uh, at gmail.com and uh, you'll get uh, more detailed pointers. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I might have one more. Um, uh -huh. If no one else has anything. Uh, you mentioned about test data. Uh -huh. And I was kind of wondering whether it needs to be like fully simulated data or it could be like a data set that I worked with? So that's a very good question. So usually you want to give um, uh, a very, very small um, test data set so that someone else can check that they're running the code correctly, right? So you'll say, mm -hmm. If, when you run it with the data set, you should you you should see a peak in this or that place, right? So they know they're running it correctly. Now, then you could have data sets that maybe are the data in your paper or a subset of the data in your paper. So those are also helpful because they're you know actual size and actually real data sets of of a sizable nature. And so um, so you should do test data sets of both kinds. Uh, a lot of people have benchmark data, for example. So you could say, when you run my software with these benchmark data sets, you can get uh, these results. And um, that's also very useful because it helps people compare uh, different approaches. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any others? OK. All right. So we'll move on to the last uh, section of the training. So we're going to talk about provenance and methods, and then we'll end with uh, kind of a recap and, and a guide, you know, guidelines, a checklist for for GPF authors. Okay. So this is about provenance and methods. Think about provenance as the way to understand the origins of an object. So you've heard about provenance regarding um, pieces of art. Uh, you know that the provenance of a bottle of champagne, if it says champagne, it has to be from that particular region. So provenance always refers to the origins of things. So the provenance in a scientific paper is all the processes and what was done to generate the results of the paper. And of course, scientific papers always have methods that describe in general how the, how the work uh, took place. So we're going to talk about documenting those two things in papers. Many ways to do this. So um, why do we want to document the provenance and the methods of the papers? Because typically when you describe the methods in a paper, uh, 
it's it's incomplete. It's just text, so it's very incomplete. So uh, here's an example of an analysis that was done on papers in Nature Genetics, and um, even if the data was available, they could not reproduce what the papers described because the the text is so ambiguous or not clear. Uh, the, the second um, point here quotes a paper that says that sometimes reproducing a paper from the paper itself is so hard, it takes so much work that it's actually research on its own. It's kind of a forensic task, right? You're trying to resuscitate the process. And so it can be a lot of work to, to figure out what was done in a particular paper. Uh, the text is very ambiguous, right? So it's not just incomplete, but it can say things, maybe they've been very specific, but there's some ambiguity. Uh, the same thing with um, uh, words or the syntax, so you never know what's attaching to what, and so it, it just leads to confusion. So I want to show you a concept of, of a workflow. So on the right-hand side, is a way to depict the method in a paper that walks you from the uh, daily data at the top. This is data coming from sensors, and this is a hydrology uh, workflow. So it takes the daily data, and then it goes through various steps. So it, it's first converting the data to a standard format. It's filtering the timestamps in various ways. It's calculating averages. And then it's running a reiteration model, a metabolism calculation, and then it's generating various plots for various um, uh, metabolism variables. So what's interesting is that this is a way to make the method in your paper a lot more explicit and a lot more clear to others. So you can look at this and you can describe this in text, but you'll never be as unambiguous and as consistent as you will be if you have a representation like this. Uh, so this shows the, how the data flows from step to step, what the parameters are, they're shown in green in this case, and what the different software uh, is doing and how it relates to what the processing of the other software looks like. So these workflows are actually a very powerful way to explain what's done in a paper. But there's really more to them because um, if you think about it, we, we had a workshop some years ago at NSF uh, and we had a lot of domain scientists, we had neuroscientists, we had astronomers, we had um, geoscientists as well. And uh, despite all the advances that you see in computer science, so there's, you know, our, our, there's more sensors, more capable, uh, much higher data collection rates, a lot more storage, very cheap uh, network bandwidth, computation, but science doesn't grow at the same exponential. There's still a lot of things that are still done manually and are still very much at the human-centered um, level. So humans are really becoming a bottleneck to science. So um, in, in that group, the scientists really said that uh, capturing and sharing and, and reusing and um, cutting and pasting and doing all kinds of things with these processes that I'm showing you on the right is very important because these processes are becoming more and more complex. The one that I'm showing you here is super simple, right? But they're becoming more and more complex and they're also highly distributed. So what we're seeing is that maybe there's a group of researchers that will work on re and will have its own complicated workflow to calculate re but then their results go to the work from another different group that's doing the metabolism calculations. So you may have these collaborations at different levels in these workflows. So when they become more complicated, then they're harder to track and to coordinate and to, to verify that, that they're uh, doing the correct thing. Um, so, so in those cases, reproducibility is very difficult. And so it's important to preserve the workflows. And it's not just for matters of reproducibility, but also being more efficient. So imagine if every paper that you run across, there's a workflow like this, and you could say, I want to upload my own data and see what comes out, what the plots look like. Imagine if you could do that, right? So it's for efficiency reasons to facilitate experimentation and so on. So, so workflows represent the methods in a paper, the processes that you're using to, to analyze data. Uh, we call them computational workflows. 
uh, as opposed to uh, you know you call a workflow the you know the workflow that you follow when you check in a hospital right first you see the triage nurse and then the next step in the workflow is to get your insurance information sorted out uh, so those are more workflows of human processes and such here we're talking about workflows of actual computations right like the one that you're seeing here. And, and maybe your workflows have some manual steps. So for example, when you're cleaning data, when you're using particular ways to get your data organized, um, Mimi and I were discussing some of her work. Maybe she can speak to this uh, later. Um, you know, that's that maybe a bunch of manual steps. It may also be that you're creating a figure, um, and, and you have some manual way to uh, uh, highlight certain things. So that, that might be also possible. And then uh, some, some workflows may access services. So in those cases, uh, you may be accessing these third-party services. Sometimes they run, sometimes they don't run. So the, the workflow becomes a little bit more um, harder to document, but you have to say these things. So if you're if you have a step where your metabolism depends on the sunrise and sunset, and that's going to access the NOAA website uh, service uh, somewhere inside, then you you should document those dependencies as well. So, but the workflows really represent the data analysis process. Um, one thing that we wanted to highlight is that your methods that you describe in a paper may be at very different levels of abstraction. So for example, in this uh, particular metabolism uh, uh, workflow that I was showing you, there's a step, and it's shown on the left, um, that does reiteration, right? But maybe I chose a particular method for uh, estimating reiteration. So I chose the Churchill model from Churchill 1956. There may be 10 others, so I could have used the O'Connor Dobbins. And so it's, sometimes it's important that you say exactly what kind of reiteration method you used. Uh, so you're referring to the particular algorithms or models. And then on the very right, you're referring to implementations. So you're referring to your implementation of the Churchill model in R and it may be that um, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it may have a bug or it may be a little bit using approximations of some kind or rounding things up in a different way. So, so you can see the value of uh, conveying your method at any of these three levels. So it's your choice to choose one or choose all of them. Uh, and you can see that others may be able to take away things in different ways, right? So if you write a paper that says, I use the Churchill model um, here, someone maybe in another discipline may not be familiar with it and may not know that it's a reiteration model. So maybe seeing something on the left would be more clear to them. Um, so, so there's value on each of these levels and you can document the methods in a paper at, at any of these levels. Um, how do you develop one of these workflows? So this is, this is at a, a very simple initial level, this is how you do this. So first, compile all the, when I say compile, maybe that's a very bad word to use here, but collect. Collect all the command line invocation for all your code. Okay, um, so this means uh, you have maybe your 50 different scripts, and so you may want to say, you know, here's all the uh, command lines that I use to call each one of them uh, for the work that I did in this paper. And the command line tells you what the input data is, what the parameters are, any configuration files, and make sure that you include also any data preparation codes as we've been emphasizing here, okay? So once you have all of these command lines, um, think about how the data flows from code to code, okay? And the, those data flows are those arrows that you see in our workflow sketches, okay? So you start uh, at the top with your input data, you lay out your input data, and then you start to work through the codes uh, that process that input data. Maybe some of the input data goes to several codes, and then the output of each code goes to the next code. So you start uh, sketching the, the general data flow, okay? Uh, you see on the right the original uh, sketch 
for the workflow that I showed you before, right? So you can see that there's a bunch of reiteration models. The Churchill model is only one of them. So that step kind of has three different models that you can use. Uh, but you can see that you have the data in the blue rectangles. Then you have data preparation steps. Uh, and you can see a little bit of the sketch. And then the actual workflow had these, but you know, more uh, fleshed out uh, kinds of steps. And if it gets large to do this, then, then just break it down into sub-workflows. So, uh, you know, you can modularize and, and drill down into details whenever you need. And if any of the steps has manual intervention, you should indicate that in some way. So uh, that's in a nutshell how you develop a workflow. Uh, and maybe if you look at some examples of workflows, you get a hang of it and, and have an easier time developing these. Uh, so here's the, the sketch again and the actual computation workflow on the right hand side. So it's pretty close, but for example, you can see that at the very end there's a, a step um, to do the computing the metabolism, and then on the right, actually, after that, you do another script that creates all the plots of things, variables that you want to see. So you can see a little bit of a different um, emphasis. So. Okay, so that's the workflow. The workflow is kind of the general method that you follow and how the codes work together. Uh, I want to talk about provenance. Provenance is about when you actually run all the codes and you generated figure six, how did you actually set the parameters, what parameter values you used, and, and what did you actually run, right? So I want to talk in general about what provenance is, and then we can talk about the provenance of papers in a bit more detail. So, uh, so provenance usually refers to uh, processes, so what was done to generate uh, a result. Uh, it may refer to documents, sometimes they're called resources, um, and it may refer to entities, people or institutions. And let me, let me explain a bit more about this. So provenance refers to, uh, when you talk about the provenance of an object, or if it's a digital object, we generally call these resources. So the provenance of a resource is a record. So it means that it's an explicit um, uh, uh, log, an explicit recording uh, that describes entities and processes that were involved in producing that resource. Not just producing, but also maybe delivering it or otherwise influencing it in that way, in some way. Okay. So if you are looking at a piece of, um, at, at a bottle of champagne, for example, it's not just that it was produced in the re in the region of uh, Champagne. You may want to know who has held that bottle in the meantime so that it has not been sitting in the sun getting degraded and, and then it's not champagne anymore uh, or who's delivering it to you to make sure that they didn't just put a fake label in the bottle okay so that's what provenance refers to and it's very critical for you know checking authenticity for trusting something particularly in science but also to allow reproducibility uh, and I want to emphasize that provenance results from past actions. So provenance refers to, I actually ran all this software and got this particular figure as a result. So it's uh, executions that you run in the past. That's what you're describing with provenance. Uh, methods are general ways to calculate reiteration, as we were seeing in the workflow earlier. Okay. That's the contrast between provenance and workflows. And then provenance is a kind of metadata. So certainly it's metadata about uh, uh, processes and resources and, and entities that were intervening to generate an object. So if you collect um, uh, data from a sensor and now you run it through some process, it's important metadata to know that it comes from that kind of sensor. But not all metadata is provenance. So for example, you can have a data set and one of its metadata characteristics is its size. And the size has nothing to do with provenance. It's just a characteristic of the of the data. Okay. So uh, let's let's look at these in turn. So so provenance as a process refers to the computing steps, the actions that we're taking. A workflow is a very good way to say I use this process, and this is how I cre I created Figure Five of this paper. Right. It's a general description of the process and the activities. 
Another aspect of provenance is what documents or what data or what resources you used that tell me uh, what uh, materials were involved in your processes. So uh, usually those are maybe the initial data that you use for your workflow or maybe um, you know documents or assumptions that you consulted. So, so uh, for example, Wikipedia, I think one of the reasons why it's very successful is because it documents the provenance very well. It's really, um, you know, in science we're used to citing people, but in, you know, real life and on the web people don't cite their sources very often. So the fact that Wikipedia paid attention to that is uh, a testament to how much we trust it because it actually tells you where things came from. So, so provenance also has to do with where did the assumptions and the data and other input resources came to your process. And then the third piece or uh, the third view is provenance as entity. So people, people or institutions uh, in getting to you the resource that you're looking at. So this is an example that I quite like which talks about the provenance of a piece of information. The piece of information being uh, Prince Harry did not do drugs, right? So that's an assertion and who said that? Who, what entity is that related to? So it was actually came from a New York Times article. Presumably there was a journalist involved. Uh, they got the news from Reuters and they're reporting that there was a press conference, so there was a speaker talking on that press conference, and it talks about Buckingham Palace because that speaker actually represented uh, Buckingham Palace and it said that. So you can see that there's you know, different entities involved in telling you how that piece of information, how that resource got to you. So you may see in science things like, you know, this came from um, uh, John Smith, who is a professor of volcanology in such and such university, who went in this expedition, they collected these rocks, and then they deposited the rocks in this um, uh, repository at AIDA, and uh, they um, then published a paper and then the paper appears at an AGU journal. So all of those different ways in which you're hearing about that particular data, about that particular volcano may be uh, important. So, so process, uh, resources, and entities are three important aspects of provenance. So You've probably heard about the Dublin Core. We mentioned it earlier. It's a very well-known provenance vocabulary. It really refers more to entities, so people and, and institutions that are involved in delivering or creating a resource and delivering it to you. The Dublin Core was created by uh, library scientists uh, trying to describe uh, resources, uh, you know, books and documents and reports and such things. It's called the Dublin Core because they initially met in Dublin, Ohio. There's nothing Irish about this. Um, so you can see, you can say the, the title of that resource, you can talk about the creator, you can look, uh, look uh, talk about a contributor, there can be a source, there can be many other uh, aspects of, of uh, entities and institutions involved. Uh, to describe provenance, you can use a vocabulary that's called prov. It will work across any discipline. It will work for objects of art, for contracts that give provenance to a particular widget that somebody fabricated for you. You can use it for documents and you can use it for signs. So uh, it has a particular set of terms that you can use to refer to uh, you know, who run your method and uh, what kinds of uh, data you used and what kinds of steps or processes you used. So W3PROV is used by a lot of workflow systems. It's uh, being used by uh, more and more data systems. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, using standards really facilitates uh, the interoperation of different resources. So. Um, then uh, here's an example of how you represent provenance with the PROV standard. So uh, on the left is your general method. So suppose that you're taking some training data and then running it through a modeler and then the output is a model and then you have some test data and you classify uh, according to that model, right? So your output, your output is a classification. So those are two 
uh, steps, two pieces of software that you run, and your input data is your training data and your test data. So in the middle is a way to describe the provenance of your results using prob. So you would have um, uh, the uh, kind of the graph going backwards because it's starting to, to document the provenance of your result, which would be the classification. And so it would point back to the things that um, were used to generate that or the resources that were used by that step and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to show you in general how it would look. And then on the right is kind of a formal description of um, you know, the, the entities that came into this particular uh, provenance. So you had the test data, you had the training data and so on. Um, you had uh, activities, so for example the classifier steps and activity, and then you had uh, for example, the classifier activity used the test data and also used the model to generate uh, the classification, right? So uh, it, it takes a bit of learning and training. There's a very nice primer document for PROV, and so you can uh, learn very easily to represent things in this way. You can see that conceptually is not very hard, just a matter to get it down. A lot of tools are beginning to adopt PROV, so, um, so sometimes all of this prov vocabulary is generated automatically for you. But you should be aware. So if some tool tells you that it uses prov to generate provenance, you should perk up and be happy about that. That's why we're teaching you about this. And then um, I want to show you here the contrast between um, the execution, which is the provenance, that's on the left, and the general method, which is the general workflow, that's on the right, right? So the structure, the, the kind of data flow structure looks very similar, but when we talk about provenance, we talk about saying, you know, I'm going to take the sensor data from August 2011, and I'm going to generate the metabolism for August 2011, and my parameters, you know, the barometric press pressure was 23, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I just made that up, and the flow was 800, and so you, you document exactly your assumptions and what you did to get the metabolism results for August, right? So as I said, provenance is in the past, it's something that you run, and it generates figure, blah, 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 in the paper, okay? So uh, on the right, you see the general method. Uh, and you can see that it's more saying, you know, well, in general, I take the sensor data for some time period, and I get the metabolism for that time period, and I might have to say what the barometric pressure estimate was and a bunch of other things, and you can uh, talk more generally about the method, okay? Uh, there's a lot of workflow systems. They will help you specify those general methods, and then they'll let you run them, and they'll generate prov for you. There's uh, some learning curve, like any sophisticated tool, uh, but they can um, help you to keep your software in, uh, on track, to share your software. Uh, for example, we did a study last year with the Loni Pipeline workflow system for uh, neuroimaging genetics, and the group that uses it really benefits from sharing and reusing workflows across. Uh, the workflow system will run their workflows in the cluster and they don't never know that there's a cluster behind, they just push the button and magic happens. So uh, different workflow systems have different capabilities, but um, they're very useful. Um, there's other benefits to the workflow, so they can actually validate that your uh, code is set up correctly, um, they can help you scale out the computations, and they may have, in some cases, very comprehensive software libraries. So for example, um, uh, um, Viz Trails is that VT in the middle will have a library of um, you know, uh, tools for visualization, for example. Another way to keep track of methods and provenance are electronic notebooks. So I mentioned the IPython notebook before. I mentioned Sweave that lets you document your LaTeX documents with R code. Um, Wolfram Alpha has um, a computable document format that also lets you track these things. There's more and more of these things happening. But conceptually, you should know that they help, help you keep track of the provenance and that there also may be a benefit to describing the general method in, in addition or separately from the provenance. 
Okay, so there's all these different ways to keep track of the provenance. Um, if you're if you if you don't have any of these things, just draw it. Just draw a workflow. Uh, just do a sketch like we uh, showed earlier. Uh, if you want to be more disciplined and you use something like Python or or R, then start to use some of these tools and and learn to use them, and it will really help you. Okay. And then finally, how do you publish the provenance and the workflows? So this is a very much of an emerging area. Uh, this is um, uh, something that's becoming more and more important to people as they realize that reproducibility is important. So there are not many provenance and workflow repositories available, not many communities sharing these repositories. But I think that's going to change very soon. So we recommend that you try to publish your workflow and your provenance. Uh, on the right, there's some um, workflow repositories, my experiment, uh, uh, there's others. Um, but at the very least, if you draw a sketch of your workflow, put it on a data repository, put it somewhere where uh, it can be given a permanent identifier and it can be cited so that your workflow has an entity in itself. Um, so, so all of that is background about methods and provenance. Uh, so, how how do we make it practical? How what what should you do to provide proper provenance in an article? So, just like we've been doing, what's the simplest approach and what's the more elaborate approach? So, the simplest approach is for you to describe your workflow in text. So, now that you know that you should describe pre-processing steps and all the assumptions and uh, how the software was used, try your best to describe it in text, right? And refer to the unique identifiers that you have uh, about the data and the software and the versions, and, and you can refer to those to say, I went from this software to that software, and it's uniquely identified by their URI or their DOI. We would also suggest that you include a workflow sketch. So that's under the number two on the left, the number two circle. So a workflow sketch would help you capture the high-level data flow. And we were showing how you can look at all the command lines and start to stitch together this general data flow that you have across your software components. And then to document the provenance, you may want to include a summary or an execution trace or something where you're showing exactly the values or the particular uh, data that you used or any uh, parameters that you used. So if you used elevation data from this NASA repository versus elevation data from this US US repository, you should, you should always uh, describe those uh, kinds of um, details. OK, so you describe the method and you describe the provenance. Ideally, ideally you would uh, do a lot more than just the text and the workflow sketch. Ideally, you would learn to use an electronic, work, uh, an electronic notebook or a workflow system. Uh, it would help you incorporate your code into the uh, workflow framework or the notebook framework. So for example, if you use IPython, I, if you use Python, the IPython notebook is, is um, fantastic. Uh, and there's people developing prof standards to publish the provenance of the things that you do in Python. If you use R, you should use Sweeve. And uh, there's people developing uh, a prof extension of R so that you can actually document the provenance of your results using prof. Um, but those are particular environments for a particular language. In contrast, a workflow system would allow you to have one step of your workflow is Fortran code. The next step is R code that you threw together. The next step is Perl code that you got from a friend. So every step might be a different uh, code base, and that's fine to do in a, in a workflow. Okay? So if you teach yourself to use either an electronic notebook or one of these workflow systems, it will have a lot of advantages. It will take some work on your side, but it will be better than your, your initial approach of just doing text and a sketch. Okay. Uh, once you have the workflow and the provenance, then put them in a repository. So either you know a workflow repository or or somewhere where your community might be looking. Uh, you can just put it on Figshare or some other data repository. They'll take 
they interpret data to mean anything. It can be figures, it can be software, it could be provenance, it could be methods as well. Okay, And then get a, a, a persistent identifier for the workflow, for the provenance, or for both. And then how to show the provenance and the workflow in the article. So typically you describe it in the method section. You should include your workflow sketch as a figure. Uh, you could put it in supplementary materials if you don't have room. And then your provenance could be a, a, a trace that you show or, or an actual prov record. And then uh, you should cite them in the paper. You should give them a URI and, and cite them just like you cite data or uh, software. Uh, so that's it for the provenance and the workflow uh, section. And I'm going to stop and see if you all have questions. Okay. So usually uh, people will sketch a workflow and then um, you know, if you show your friends and you start to explain how the data flows, sometimes their questions help you debug your workflow. So at the very least, uh, start to think about how to sketch your workflows, um, you know, as you're thinking about publishing your code. Okay. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, when <laughs> a lot of my workflows end up looking like really complicated, do some of these tools that you're describing help to simplify workflows? You get rid of getting rid of unnecessary sketch steps, or I don't know. That's a very good. That's a very good point. So um, let's see. So there's many answers to that. One is that um, when when I, for example, go to uh, a funding agency and I say it's very important that you invest in better uh, tools to develop workflows, to represent the workflows and assist the scientists to turn their spaghetti descriptions into something that can be more clearly comprehended, right? They look at me and they say, oh, the scientists don't ask for that. I don't know that they need that, right? So when you talk to people about what would be important for you and for your work, uh, ask about workflows. Ask about, you know, my workflow is very complicated. How, you know, how can I get help to, to do that better? That's one thing. Uh, but even with the tools that we have today, um, you can um, you, you can specify sub-workflows. So you can take a portion of the workflow and turn it into a box that you use in the higher level workflow. So that's one way to do it. And in fact, when you sketch your workflow, many times you'll say, so this one step is a step where I do feature extraction. And it's its own workflow. So you may have a separate figure to do the details of how you did that particular step, right? And it's maybe 40 more steps. Uh, the, the thing that you have to think about is that the workflows may look extremely complicated, but maybe conceptually they are not. So maybe the provenance record where you're actually detailing every single piece may look very, very uh, hairy, but the general conceptual method may not be. Uh, so think about, there's many different ways to do abstractions. So think about ways to do abstractions. So maybe do a workflow that walks through very high level conceptually what it's trying to do and then maybe take each of those uh, you know 10 or 20 steps and then say so for this one in particular here's a much more detailed one and that way maybe those detailed ones will be less hairy so uh, you know it's it's a little bit of an art to do this but the thing is that if you do not find a way to explain your workflow clearly then no one is going to build on your work, right? Because they're not going to understand exactly what you did or how to, you know, compare their method to yours because they can't even uh, figure out what exactly happened uh, when you did your work. So uh, it, it takes some thinking to create a workflow, but my experience has been that every time that someone like you actually gives it some thought and creates these sketches that convey the main ideas of what they did to the data and how it worked, they always end up saying, 
this is great because now I can tell people exactly what I did. It's much easier to explain. People actually understand it, and I actually have a much e much easier time uh, explaining all the pieces of my research. So it's it's you know for yes, what I would I, definitely agree with that because I have my giant uh, whiteboard things for each individual section of the sub workflow. Uh huh. And before writing them, it's very difficult to even work on the model because it's only in my head and nowhere else. Yes. And so having it on paper really helps me, but a lot of times I would say other people look at my sub workflows and say, I can't understand anything. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I have yeah. to develop that a little bit better. Maybe I need to look more at uh, examples of other people what they've done. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think one of the goals with having these uh, GPF papers in a special issue is that maybe you can see examples of how other people have managed to describe a workflow and, and you'll see an example from Mimi in a minute and her workflow is not simple. <laughs> okay. okay, but uh, yeah, so but I'm glad that this, this training gets you to think about uh, doing that so I think that's very important. Uh, there's a mailing list for GPF authors. It will come up in a minute, so it's a perfect forum to say, I tried to describe my workflow. Here's three pages and some figures about it. Would anyone give me feedback on it? And, you know, you never know who's out there. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, we're going to wrap up. We're going to talk about um, a checklist for GPF authors, so uh, making sure that you get kind of the high level points that we've been covering in this training and um, uh, there's a few of those but then I'm going to turn it over to Mimi to talk about her particular uh, paper so that you can maybe see more concretely how she addressed things and what she did and you can ask her questions. So, Okay, so to recap what we said for a GPF was that the data should be in a public repository with metadata, with licenses and you should be able to cite the data with a unique and persistent identifier. And the same for software and the same for provenance. And those terms that you see in the text here, maybe at the beginning of this training, didn't mean a whole lot of specific things for you, but now it should mean something to you, right? When we talk about the citation, you've seen what the citation should look like, right? Okay, so this picture also I showed you earlier, uh, so see that the GPF has aspects of making the publication reproducible by documenting the provenance and the methods. It has these aspects of open science, making sure that you put your data in a public shared repository, that you attach a license, that you put metadata uh, wherever you can and have energies to do. And then all these aspects of the digital scholarship, make sure that you're, you don't just put a URL that will be broken in two months, that you make it persistent, that you use DOIs, and that you cite things properly so that others can get credit and you can get credit in turn, okay? So let's review um, the, the topics that we covered in the training today, one by one. So data accessibility, we said, well, the simplest possible thing that you can do is just put your uh, data set in a, in a public place with a persistent identifier. So go to Figshare, go to Zenodo if you like that better, anything you like. Uh, create an account and then just upload your data set. It will take you minutes. Uh, seconds almost, but it will take you just a few minutes. And then put some metadata, very importantly, put a license, say anybody can use this piece of data, that's what my license will tell them, so that's very important. And then upload the data, that's it. And then Figshare will give you a data citation, it will give you a DOI, and you're done. There's no excuse to not share your data. It just takes minutes. It just takes no time at all. And if you make it part of your practice uh, and you start citing your data, you will get more credit. Your paper will get more read. That's what the, the research indicates. Okay? So that's the simplest approach. The ideal approach is that longer term, 
or when you get together with colleagues in your community, figure out what repository should your community use so that you find each other's data more easily. So maybe it's Pangea, maybe it's something else that you all agree to. But uh, you know, find the repository that everybody will agree to use and then just stick with it. I think one of the things that EarthCube will do is make it very easy for people to find those repositories. And Mimi gave you some uh, pointers to how to find repositories in your area. Uh, and then remember about in the GPF itself, uh, show the, the citation for the paper, uh, sorry, the citation for the data that, that you're using. Okay, uh, to document the data, remember at least put uh, general purpose metadata like the creator, the date, the name of the data set. Ideally, you would put more metadata. So if you're using water data, you may look at a standard like water ML. If it's climate data, the CF metadata would be great. Ocean, you have the marine metadata, MMI uh, metadata. So, so find some uh, metadata that people use in your field and you, know, you can spend more time. That would be the ideal approach. Uh, in the GPF, you would actually show all this metadata as, um, you know, your, your, your data lives somewhere and it should have a pointer to these metadata descriptions or if you have a, a data paper or if you want to add the metadata as supplementary material. But this data documentation should show up in the paper as well. Uh, making the software accessible, remember we said simplest possible thing, it will take you minutes. Just post it on your site and make sure that you get a permanent URL. Or post it on Figshare, just get an account, upload it, you're done. And at the very minimum, specify some metadata like who you are, that you're the author, and include a license to tell others how they can use your code and then what kind of citation you want for your code. Um, the, the citation should have the version. We mentioned that, but it's very similar to the way that the data is cited. Uh, the software documentation, we mentioned the simplest possible thing that you can do is just be mindful about the types of metadata that we mentioned before. If you use GitHub, there's a lot of places where metadata goes. If you put the software in your website, just think about all the different categories of, of metadata that we mentioned earlier to describe the software. Ideally, you use something Ontosoft is an example. We talked about CSDMS. Uh, there's other repositories, CIG and others, where you actually go through uh, forms to, to specify this metadata. And remember, you can save this metadata as HTML or XML and then bring it to wherever you have the code, to GitHub or wherever else. So you'll have all of that documented. And then in the paper itself, you could have uh, all of this metadata supplementary material. You could make it part of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of it's pointed from your uh, the software repository itself. So you just mentioned that, uh, but you make sure that you say in the paper that this software documentation is available. Then we talked about provenance and methods. So the simplest thing to do is to just describe your workflow in text, include a sketch, and then for provenance, just the trace of a run where you're actually recording the settings of all your parameters, etc. And then uh, ideally, you would document more things. So you may use an electronic notebook or a workflow system to really record all the details automatically and uh, publish the workflow and the provenance uh, structures. Uh, you know, get a persistent identifier or a DOI. You can post them in a data site like Figshare, for example, and get a DOI and show that. Uh, in the GPF, you can include these sketches and these workflows in the paper, um, or you can use uh, execution traces, just include them in the supplementary material. And then finally, and we haven't mentioned that yet, but just like all of your data and your software has a DOI or a, or a permanent URL, every author should have that. So I have a colleague whose name is Jihee Kim, J. Kim. There's millions of J. Kims in the world, so she can never be uniquely identified. Uh, there's a biologist uh, that publishes a lot in biology that has my name, Yolanda Gill, so uh, it's impossible to distinguish her record from my record very easily. And machines cannot do this very easily. So you need to use something like uh, a unique identifier for yourself. Every researcher should have one. And so a place to do that is uh, orchid.org uh, and uh, 
the, the journal that we're using, the AGO journal, also has instructions on the website to do this. But just get an ORCID for yourself and you can have it forever. Um, so, so that's it. That's the GPF author checklist and um, it kind of, I hope it helps summarize and write things together. And like I promised at the beginning, we give you the simplest possible approach that will take you minutes and then the more complicated, longer term investments that you can make to teach yourself about additional things and what you will get out of them. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Mimi for a second so that she can um, talk about uh, her paper. I think that might be one of the most uh, interesting things for you to hear about. So um, can you pass the screen to her? Yep, I will pass it. Okay, Mimi, I just passed it back to you. Okay, and I guess I'm back on. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you and see you. Okay, great. Okay, so my paper, my GPS paper is uh, about a permanent mooring station that's off the coast of Mobile, Alabama. It's been running since 2004. It is still going. It's had two different funding sources, well, three different funding sources in that time, uh, two official ones, and then right now it's just being funded by uh, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Um, okay, so here's the location. This is the Gulf of Mexico, Dolphin Island. Okay, and Dolphin Island is this far here. I'm over here. This is where the mooring is. Um, and this is the instrument array that is at this mooring. It's got a buoy. It's a 20 meter step. So it's got a moor, a, a buoy at the top. It's got a CT, surface. It's called a surface CTD, but it's actually about four meters down. And it's got thermistors. There's five of them. Uh, each thermistor just records temperature, except for the bottom one, which sometimes records pressure also. The YSI instrument uh, re is mostly there to record uh, near bottom dissolved oxygen. And then you've got an ADCP which is a acoustic stock plar current. It collects uh, current velocity data, water current velocity. And then it's got a bottom CTD um, that collects uh, temperature salinity and depth at the bottom. Okay, so the data that comes off of here, it comes, we've been collecting it since 2004. Uh, because there were two different funding sources, we wrote metadata for this, the whole thing in two parts. The 2004 to 2006 part was under a compass, was under, a, was actually a, originally um, an oil, was a gas or oil? It was something like that. They were trying to use it to figure out how they could get liquidified natural gas out of that spot. And so they were going to do a, an impact, environmental impact study. So that's where the mooring originally got established. And then after that, it went into the FOCAL program, which was Fisheries Oceanography in Coastal Alabama from 2006 to 2012, and right now it doesn't have any particular funding, so it's just being funded by uh, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, who mostly just, most of the expense is just taking the boat out there and trading out the instruments and doing uh, just very basic maintenance of the instruments and making sure that everything is running. Um, okay, so the types of data that comes out of there, mostly a lot of temperature. Uh, we also do a CTD cast. Um, when we get out there, that each every time they go out there to exchange the, the moored instruments, they do a, a vertical profile, which basically you drop the instrument package from the surface, it goes to the bottom, and then comes back up. That you can get just a vertical line of temperature, salinity. Uh, there's actually about 12 different variables that it measures. So, and this, these are temperature, and this is from the current velocity, the ADCP at the bottom. Um, the data. Okay, because it's a, it's a really large data set that goes from 2004 to, to present, uh, for my paper, I just took the part that was, there was like a few months in 2011, that uh, one of the, uh, the faculty members here was using for one of his papers. And so I thought, okay, we'll just take that little subsection of it and document in detail exactly how it, uh, was, pro how it was processed from the time that it was downloaded from the sensors at the array and, and you know all of the individual processing steps that it took to do the data preparation 
to get it to a point where you can use it for uh, scientific data analysis and start using the data for asking actual science questions and doing research with it. And it is actually a very, really involved process. So, you know, this is this sort of information has actually taken up the entire length of my uh, technical report for for the GPF. Okay, the software that I use to do all of these this data processing, uh, there's actually two parts to it. One, there's the proprietary software that came with each of the sensors uh, that you know the the manufacturers of the sensors wrote. Um, some very small apps so that you can interface with the instrument, download the data, configure the instrument, things like that. And you use those pieces of software. They're all graphical user interface based. And you use that to uh, do the initial processing to get it from the completely raw data. And a lot of times it's in hex files. And it's like in a, like the Seabird instruments put out hex files, which are encoded in a hex format instead of actually readable ASCII. And then you use the software they provide to turn it into actual numbers, and you feed in the the, configure, the uh, calibration information at the same time, and then after you get through all of the proprietary software, you run it through. I run it through a series of MATLAB scripts to turn it. You do a whole bunch of um, additional calculations, and then it turns it into those graphs that you saw on the previous screen, and puts out a bunch of uh, uh, comma delimited files and space delimited files, which can then be imported into other things for additional analysis. Uh, the metadata for the software, I didn't bother to do anything with the proprietary software. In my paper, I just refer to it and put a link to the manufacturer website where you can find it. Um, so the metadata I concentrated on was for the MATLAB scripts that I wrote. Uh, there were two main ones. One does everything related to the ADCP, which does the water current velocity, and the other one does basically all of the other instruments in the array, the thermistors, the two CTDs, and the CTD cast. And I use the Ontosoft uh, portal that uh, Yolanda was showing you in detail a bit ago with the, the pie chart with the six sections. And so I fill, fill that out for um, basically the two Perl's, the two MATLAB scripts and the one Perl script that is kind of the precursor before the MATLAB script. And, uh, and those are going to eventually get packaged into. Uh, I'm going to be taking the metadata and the and the software and putting that together to a single file and putting it down on Zenodo, um, and then that, get a DOI for that. And that will be how I cite it in the actual paper. Uh, Zenodo is very similar to Figshare. The main difference between Zenodo and Figshare is that Figshare is, uh, as far as I can tell, it's a private for-profit enterprise. And Zenodo is something that is run by CERN, which is the place in Switzerland that also does the uh, Large Hadron Collider thingy. And so I just figured that CERN had a better academic reputation, uh, and it would be it made more sense to put our type of um, research products on on there than on Figshare. So that's why I like it a little bit better. Uh, for provenance of methods, this is the uh, the simplest approach rather than the ideal approach. I didn't do anything too fancy. I just took this is basically a sketch of how the uh, how everything is processed. So, for example, over here in the upper left, you have sensors, a list of the sensors, and these are the names of the files that were output for the period that was between April and May of 2011. And then in each of the individual files goes through a slightly different process depending on which what kind of file it is and what kind of instrument it came off of. Um, so I have little arrows that shows you which proprietary which which files go through which proprietary software to make which intermediate files, which then goes to more proprietary software. And eventually you end up with a set of well, for everything except the ADCP. So there's nine files and that goes into the Perl script that then and the Perl script then takes all of the outputs from the proprietary software and turns it into something that MATLAB can import. Because MATLAB um, is extremely picky about what kind of file formats it can understand. So you have to, so there was an, so the, the whole point of the Perl script was just so that, to make it so that MATLAB can read it. And the Perl script also um, parses out of the headers of each of these output files, um, like import information like uh, the date and time, the type of sensor it is, and things like that. And then 
once you've got it into a MATLAB readable format, there's a whole bunch of manual steps involved in um, finding where the good data is because what the lab does here is they will take the instrument and turn it on before they've left the lab and then they'll you know take the boat out put it at the uh, mooring and then a month later they collect it and then they take it back to the lab and then they turn it off so there's a whole lot of uh, numbers being recorded in these instruments while the thing is going from the from the lab to the boat to the mooring and then from the mooring back to the lab, that isn't really real data from the ocean, that we, so we don't really need it. So you have to go through and open each of these files individually to figure out where the actual beginning and ending of the good data is. And that's what step E1 in this diagram was about. And then once you've got those numbers, you record, I recorded it into the, the Perl script actually outputs a little, a small text file where you can record the numbers of the good scan numbers. And then it goes to the main uh, MATLAB script that does everything else. And this script does all of the uh, primary computations. It does things like computes density off of for several of the instruments. It uh, creates a large number of figures. The figures that I had two slides ago are output that way automatically by this MATLAB script. And it puts out all the text files in the, in the comma separated and uh, space delimited. And then for the ADCP, it does a very similar sort of path. It, it goes through the proprietary software. You have to have a small text file that gives you some basic input parameters. You have to go look up where the beginning and ending uh, scan numbers are for where the good data started and where the good data ended. And also, which bin, which vertical bin is at the top, because um, because as, as you get far, closer and closer to the surface, there are more errors. In the uh, in the upper, and so you want to look for the one that's as high up as possible that still has mostly good data and and stop there. So that's what so you have this little input file that gives you that information, and then it goes through a big a big MATLAB script that does outputs a whole bunch of figures and um, data tables and things. Um, and that's basically what my entire paper is about. The main thing I've learned is that it takes a lot of text to explain all of explain something like this. Um, the ES, the Earth and Space Science Journal has technical reports that has a certain maximum length. And I'm, I'm actually right at the maximum length already, just trying to explain what this graph you're looking at does. And you know, the, the path of the, uh, all of the different individual files as they're getting processed. That's pretty much it for what I have about this. Thank you, Mimi. That's great. So I, I learned a lot about how data from sensors is actually processed and the challenges there uh, just from Mimi's paper and, and the way that she's described the work. So it's it's uh, extremely useful for, for everybody, I think, to expose science in this way that's more explicit and, and more uh, documented. So. Any questions for Mimi about this? Okay, so so this is an example. There will be a lot of different papers in the special issue that will give you examples about different uh, kinds of uh, uh, GPFs in different areas. So you can uh, learn from examples as well. Okay, so we're, we're going to wrap up. Um, so. Uh, Mimi gave you her example, uh, but we just went through kind of the author checklist for a geoscience paper of the future, showing all these different pieces. I wanted to remind you of this special issue of, of the journal, so consider um, submitting something to this. Uh, you have a lot of time until January 1st. You can either do it in some research that you're doing right now, Fun. or there's... You're not actually sharing your screen. I have to give the screen back to you. Oh, okay. All right. I just did it. I just passed it. Just passed it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, so remember the, that you could either write a geoscience paper of the future from the whatever research you're doing and you're wanting to publish right now, or from something that you did in the past. So, a couple of our authors are actually. Uh, writing 
paper based on their thesis that they did some years ago. And so they're documenting a lot of the processes and the details that they didn't uh, write down uh, in, the, in the original science paper that they wrote. So uh, what uh, I want you to know is that we just gave you an idea of, of the major best principles and uh, hints for where to start. But as you saw, there's a lot of additional things to learn about. So uh, learn about what people do in your community and how, what data repositories they use. Learn about what metadata standards they use. Learn about uh, what they do with your software, uh, with their software, so that you can find it. Uh, you know, foster, organize uh, workshops or meetings where you can agree to these things, and uh, teach yourself more. If you use R or MATLAB or, or Python, teach yourself more about these tools. Um, block some time, maybe once a week for a month, uh, an afternoon a week for a month, and, and teach yourself something about IPython notebook or a workflow system or something like that. Um, there's a way to get you help if you run into any questions or problems. There's an FAQ that we're uh, starting uh, from anyone interested in the geoscience paper of the future. So there's a URL to that in the slides. Uh, there's public mailing list for authors, so you can ask questions. You can ask about particular tools that you are uh, trying to learn to use or recommendations. There's also a um, uh, additional uh, training sessions coming up if there's some piece that you didn't quite get or, or any other questions that you may have. And then um, we are interested in facilitating the formation of author groups. So just like we had an initial batch of uh, you know the, the GPF authors that you see on the right, the 13 original GPF authors, uh, maybe there's another group that wants to get together and every week they'll talk about, you know, so did you decide to use Figshare or Zenodo? How did you do this? And that always helps because it's a group that's finding the same problems. And um, if you're interested in this, uh, just send us email. Um, and then other than that, there's more training sessions coming up. Tell your friends, uh, help us spread the word if you thought this was helpful. And we just uh, want to acknowledge uh, funding, colleagues, um, people that have sent us comments. If you have thoughts or comments about something that was really good or something that was not so good, uh, let us know as well. And with that, um, I think we'll conclude. Um, Unless anyone has a final question or thought? Okay, thank you for staying with us. And I hope this was useful to you. And um, I hope to read your GPF very soon. Thanks. Thanks, Yolanda. Thanks, Sarah.